My guest today is Bill Simph. Bill, how are you, my friend? I'm very well. Thank you very much. Uh, what, tell us what you do for a living, Bill. I am an application security architect. My job is to help developers write more secure code. That sounds like an important job. I think a lot of us know, they kind of, we, yeah, we're kind of aware really that security long. is important, but we don't really know exactly how. I think that's probably describes the majority yeah, of yeah, the, most writing the, software. The, the realities of application security dig into places that you wouldn't expect them to go. And the, even the weirder thing is a lot of the stuff you hear about that is ascribed to this vendor or this group or whatever is really an application security problem at its core. I mean, hmm. all, yeah, the, 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 the flaws in routers and stuff, there's code for those routers. <laughs> I mean, that flaws in the code. It's not, it's not yeah. some magical thing because it's a router. It's, it's a, it's in the code. Yeah, and I've uh, I think you've established yourself as one of the experts in this field of security, and I yes. I, I, don't also, go that far, I well I, I often tell the story about how we met. I don't know if it was the first time we actually met, but the first time we had a long extended conversation, right. and I was struggling with an identity framework, yep. Yep. I and I reached out. <laughs> I just reached out to on you know what do you do when you're struggling? You whine on the internet, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, I, and and Bill Simph responded, and we I ended up driving down to Columbus. And we uh, we had lunch together, and you explained some real key concepts. We, we, we solved the really, problems really, really of the nice. world in a in a whole food uh, <laughs> whole, whole food uh, uh, snack area. Exactly, exactly. I tell that story often. It's the it, mostly about the power of community and uh, yeah. being able to connect and expand your network, and therefore have those kinds of resources. But uh, but also because it's uh, I happen to catch on somebody who was an expert in this field of identity and security. Um, and now it's years later, what, at least 10 years later. Oh, yeah. Maybe, 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 maybe 13. More than that. Oh, yeah. definitely more than that. Um, and, um, uh, and you're even smarter now. <laughs> oh, no. God. Now I'm even more beaten down. It's like, oh, geez. How many well, more things? <laughs> <laughs> well, now the, the world has changed, actually. I mean, yes. the, the security, the, the bad guys don't stand still. And no. every time we catch up with them, then, um, well, and they, then they, they, it's we, like we a leapfrog. To... Yeah, we have the new risks problem, right? Because it's awesome we come up with new technologies all the time, IoT and and, and new trends in, in social networking and stuff. But every time we add a layer technologically, it comes with its own particular risks sure. and potential problems. And that that's so we're always, even though the base of application security, the core concepts haven't really changed, the way they're implemented changes every time that something new and hip gets added hey let's make computer controlled cars that's an awesome idea yeah except for the fact that i can control it too so sure is that really a great idea and and very few people stop to think that when they're creating the next big thing and that's yeah. that's the that's why we're always chasing them we're always yep. chasing it well what is new so what, what are the things that um that we didn't have to think about 10 years ago that yeah. now we're thinking about today well, some some things are you know stuff that's old is new again. It's it's really funny you bring up the the identity chat and and talking about um, dealing with Active Directory and, and coding against it because access control is again like way up in the forefront of that um, it, because we, uh, we okay so to go back a little ways for a long time I would tell people um, in identity talks. Don't build your own identity system unless you have no choice. I mean, use your corporate AD and code against it. Make a separate, you know, hive of users that you can for, for your public users and and code against that if you're working in .NET. You know, um, use LDAP. Use use if you've got a completely public website, don't shy away from using Facebook or or or, or Google as a uh, OAuth provider and log in that way. So you don't have to manage passwords. That's the main mm -hmm. thing we're going about that. Well, apparently everybody thought that was a good idea. So now there's a bunch of companies out there that are basically doing that. Yeah. Uh, Okta and Ping and, and, and all these other uh, places that are, that, that, that are, are supporting primary identity management for large corporations. And that is, in a way, awesome, because that's what I've been teaching people for many, many years now. Um, even w when I was primarily a developer, 
when I had to do integrations or when I had to design identity into a system, the first place I'd look would be, okay, can we use our AD? Can we, is it public? Can we use their public credentials? You know, their Facebook credentials, their Google credentials. Um, and, and so from that perspective, I'm happy because people are less likely to be storing passwords insecurely in their own database where they're probably going to get taken. You, they right. leave it to somebody else to lose it. I mean, protect it. Um, and uh, the, the issue is the same issue that you had 13 years ago, or however long it was. <laughs> it's integration. Integration is hard. I mean, it's super easy to say, hey, we've got this identity system, but look, people can log in and then they don't have to log in anywhere else. Isn't it fantastic? But when you've got a Spring MVC app you wrote in, you know, 2004 that has its own username and password store, you need to update it to use ping. Mm -hmm. Then you've got a whole new world. And the, we run into the sample code problem, right? Sample code isn't your friend. They put sample code out that's very straightforward that gets you up and running. Right. So, for instance, you know, to do initial authorization, sending basic auth in the header, which mm -hmm. is fine for internal things that are never going to see the public. But you, you can't, even under TLS, you can't send a, a, your username and password in a header repeatedly like that over and over again. You, eventually, it's going to get lost. Mm -hmm. It's just not the best way to do things. Um, and, but it's still, that's what you find in the sample code is quick, easy. Hey, look, here's how you integrate our tool. Um, go for it. And then when you actually have to make it secure, and, and make it stable for your platform, you've, you've got to write a lot of newly original code and that's hard. It's demanding right. and it's, it's been demanding and it's still demanding. And yeah, so that's, that's one of the big ones that have, that have come up. And I know, you know, you're talking all the time about uh, Azure related stuff, David, um, the, 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 the new, what's the Entra? 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 The new? Yeah, Entra, which is a rebranding of it, it's the, uh, Azure. It's basically AD, right? It's like the cloud AD, Azure AD, except it's um, it's 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 uh, a, a closer to the product that put, it's put out by Ping and, and like that. Um, except it really takes advantage of Azure, which brings a whole load of benefits with it. Um, and that's something else is when when you. Uh, Anytime you tie in identity systems with your cloud system, that's uh, another level of, of complexity. Uh, the, the trend towards uh, offsite management of large scale applications using infrastructure or software as a service um, is, is becoming real popular. And that's another problem that I run into uh, in findings with, with application security vulnerability analysis that I do is misconfigured cloud systems. And of course, all the, the back when it started, the, the classic example was the, the um, S3 bucket that was open to everybody because it's a big, long URL. So nobody's ever going to guess that, right? <laughs> well, no, that's actually not how it works at all, but that's okay. It's not okay. Well, you need to, you need to do authorization on your, on your, on your uh, internet storage. Um, but, but, all of the configuration now that takes place in the cloud environment used to be somebody knew how to set up the Windows server just so and set up their Cisco system just so and set up their WAF just so. And they had all these little blinky light boxes all over this room that they could sit and tweak. And there was somebody who knew how it all worked. Now we, we pick everything up, we set it in Azure. Then all of a sudden we've got this situation where all the little fiddly things we would do when we owned the boxes no longer apply. We have to learn a completely new paradigm for configuring all of those pieces to work together. And mistakes are rampant. And you've got to deal with that all the time in what you do, David. I mean, with, with, the, with the various and sundry uh, uh, cloud environments out there that you're dealing with. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. the cloud, so I think everything you're talking about here is we as software developers are trying to build things that make life easier for other people, make things more accessible. You bet. Self-driving cars sounds awesome. Um, yeah. But by making things more accessible to, to the user, we're also making it more accessible to the bad guys. 
Right. And so it, you know, it, it used to be it used to be you couldn't you had to drive to the server and sit down at the keyboard and log yeah. in physically. You know, f- servers were physically isolated. Well, we made up this great idea. Let's have remotely be able to access them. What a wonderful thing. Well, guess yeah. what? There's uh, but, well, bad guys yeah, out it, there trying to remotely access your data. <laughs> absolutely. And we just gave them another doorway into that, That's which right. we need to secure. And, and, and the doorway that we, I mean, the, the, all the cloud providers regularly change their backends. They're having to keep up with the times too. So they're mm-hmm. modifying what's happening on on the, on their end of the stick, which means everybody who's managing those cloud applications, they have to keep up with whatever is changing and keep up yeah. with their own stuff too. You know what it's I like mean? It's like a game of Leapfrog. It is very much a game of Leapfrog or Frogger. Yeah, just in should be with the big, <laughs> with the big yeah, the, the, the trucks going across and, you know. <laughs> Which one um, are we? Are we the frogs or are we the trucks? <laughs> I'm not sure. I, hey, I was, like I was, these days. <laughs> I, I was looking at, uh, you sent me a deck, and thank you for that, about a talk oh, that you sometimes give about trends and application security. And I'm mm-hmm. surprised to see SQL injection on here because SQL injection is not new at all. It's, no. it's been around for, it's been a problem for decades. It's it's still a problem. So, yeah, it's a, it, it, yes, it's never gone away. Okay. There's a reason why injection is still way high up in the OWASP top. Oh, you should probably define, let's define SQL injection, please. Yeah, we'll define SQL injection. It's a great idea. So SQL injection, injection in general is anytime when you tell it, you make a backend system confuse its data with your code. So you, you know, you have a database, send it some data, it inserts the data, send it some data, queries the data, send it the data, updates the data, send it the data. And then say, by the way, this part isn't data. This part is code. I want you to run for me after you do this data stuff. And it goes, okay, because it doesn't know, you know, it's, it's following the rules of the language and the rules of the language are such that if you lay things out just so you can say, you know, go collect me a list of the, the, you know, bananas in, the, in my cart. And, oh, by the way, send me a list of all the users and their passwords. Right. And and that's 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 SQL inj- database injection in general, but injection can happen in all kinds of things. You can, I mean, cross site scripting, which is a relatively famous user interface vulnerability, is just browser injection. Mm-hmm. It's making the browser confuse its data, which is kind of the HTML and, and CSS, with your code. So you it runs your code instead of the code it's supposed to run. Um, and uh, so, so that's where SQL, and we, we solved SQL injection a lot when in, in the contemporary corporate development space, when object relational models started to spin up and get good. So you could, you could use an ORM and it would parameterize queries for you because in reality, the only way to really beat um, SQL injection specifically is by parameterizing the query so that the, the database knows without an absolute doubt where the code is and where the data is, because it's, it's not getting pieces and bits of things like it happens if you can catnip together a string and pass it in. Right. Um, the, what I've seen, it's really funny because ORMs are still out there, they're still in popular use, but as, the, as applications grow, people find things that their object base doesn't do that they need to, to, they need to implement. Like for instance, a, they buy a company and they need to search products from two companies. Okay. Well, suddenly the search query now can't just use the RM, you know, items.search, whatever that, that you, you, you built into your, your object model. Um, you have to hand write something. And you, you can do that. Oh, every ORM supports some kind of parameterized query functionality, but very rarely do people use it. They're like, oh man, I've got to hack together some, some SQL here real quick. I'll just concatenate together a string and send it in. Bang. There you are right there on your homepage search screen SQL injection. Right. Um, where I found it recently specifically is in get parameters. So if you look at, um, your, your average web request, right? There's there's two main kinds. There's many kinds. There's two main kinds, right? There's the get request, um, and the, the, there's the post request. And the get request has its parameters in the query string itself. So right. semf.net slash some endpoint question mark 
query string parameters, right? Right. So you put your parameters in there and then you can use them in your backend code or wherever you need them. Uh, or the JavaScript can reach up and grab them under some circumstances or whatever. Um, <clears throat> whereas a post parameter, everything's in the body. And you can have URL parameters, but you shouldn't according to the RFC. Right. But people do it all the time, including me. It's not, I mean, it's become pretty common. But the bulk of the data is in the body, not in the query string. Right. Um, you want to keep as much stuff out of the query string in general as possible. It's just a good idea um, because uh, URLs get lost all the time. Hmm. They get logged. They get it's sent in instant messenger. They get posted to Discord channels. They get lost all the time. And it, the, the people know that that blob of weird text in there was actually your API key and you needed that. Um, <laughs> so, but, but still lots of people do the, you know, the search slash items question mark, you know, feel or uh, search query equals yeah. some For, parameter that the user has entered, right? It does make it easier to bookmark. Y it does. Yeah. Well, that's, well, that's an, but that's another leakage is bookmarks. Right. Because people always like publish their bookmarks and they didn't know they're actually publishing their account information as long with it anyway. Mm. But it does. That's true. Um, but the, the, if you're using something from the query string to populate a SQL query, you need to understand that parameter, even though it's not coming from a form, which is where all the examples of SQL and check showers of some form post with, you know, first name, last name, email address, you know, and then tell me about yourself and the tell me about yourself field is injectable. So you, you can basically type an injection in there and press enter and ta-da, you're in. Mm -hmm. All the examples are like that. None of them use get parameters for their examples. So people have gotten it in their head that those that's a get parameter can't be injectable. Yes, it can. Ah. It's, it's, it's trivial to inject. In fact, it's easier to inject than a get parameter. And you have less protection on the back end too. Um, <clears throat> from as far as input validation is concerned, especially. But um, one thing you, uh, but but yeah, it, it's it's a it's it's if you're using that parameter, that parameter is injectable. It doesn't matter whether it's coming from a form post or from wherever. Um, and of course, the the protection for that is far deep down inside, out way ab away from the HTTP stuff. It's down at the database level where. You need to send it a parameterized query, not some string right. you cobbled together and ran a database connection dot run on or whatever a dot execute. So yeah, it's right. it, and it, like I said, it's never really gone away. I, I I pick up one or two SQL injection vulnerabilities a month in tests that I do, <laughs> uh, but yeah. it's been like more like one or two a week for the past little bit for some reason. Uh, it's, that's why. scary. And it's all been get parameters. Yeah. What um. I, I noticed that uh, I've been railing for decades for people to start using source control to yeah. manage their code. Yeah. Uh, but you pointed out that there are problems with source control. There's yeah, absolutely. Issues. I mean, and it's not problems with source or control. Pot potential problems. I should large, say. right? It's um, it's public source control. Right. Right. So pe people will write um, code and be like, hey, this is some pretty cool code. You know, I'm going to throw it up on GitHub so that it, people will think it's cool, you know, and maybe talk about it. And, you know, I can point at it next time I'm in a job interview or whatever. And they also check in their API keys. Uh, yeah. Or their connection you know? strings or their passwords. Yeah, it's, it's, or connection string. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and that's, that's the big, that's the big thing, but the, 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 that's really only part of the problem. There's, there's a much larger scope thing related to um, related to source control uh, in in general um, with relation to the software supply chain. So it's 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 broader than just you know source control. Source control obviously is absolutely necessity, especially within a project group. But if you're if you're writing public software, open source software. Or just soft, even if you have a restrictive license, if you're putting it out where other people can see it, you need to take secrets very seriously and understand what it is exactly you're putting up there. But the, the issue comes even further down the line when other people consume that code to do things. 
and we create something of a software supply chain, right? So people, people pull, um, they, hey, there's a, a cool library that does this. I'm going to use it to build a library that does this that with using this to help. And the next person says that. And then you end up with a chain four or five deep of this product depends on this product, depends on this product, depends on this product, depends on this product. And all of them are just maintained by some dev somewhere who's just nice and, and is giving their code away for fun right. and can stop at any time or make a mistake or anything else without any oversight because it's just a couple of folks sitting and chatting on Discord and coding and saying, sure. hey, this is neat. Let's let's publish it. And you people know? are building their business on top. And of And people this. are building their business on it. That's exactly right. So you you look at that taken to its extreme, and we just had this happen. And anybody who follows information security probably has heard about this, but there is a um, compression algorithm that's used very heavily in Linux called XZUtils, and it's been around for a long time. It's extremely high quality. The person who wrote it has forgotten more about compression than you are I'll ever learn. It's, I believe that it's really impressive stuff. But um, to make a long story short, uh, he fell behind on the project. Some other community members stepped in to kind of help. One of those community members wrote a bunch of malware into it and um, snuck it into the test suite, and a bunch of places deployed it oh. to their operating system. So the OS actually came with a built-in built in malware that nobody knew was there. And it was blind luck that we discovered it. Um, a Somebody doing micro millisecond uh, performance testing on, on um, one database or another, I don't remember which one, uh, r realized that the, the timing was off compared to what they'd done two weeks ago and went looking for why and found out there's all these other processes that are running when there's decompression or compression going on. Couldn't figure out what it was. It was because of the malware. Mm. <clears throat> so he discovered it. They put out a CVE. They put out what? A CVE, the, um, the, the notification that says, hey, there's a bug in the software. Be careful mm. or patch or roll back or whatever you need to do. Um, <clears throat> and everything, it, we, we kind of got it nipped in the bud, but it was blind luck that we did. Mm. It was, I mean, it was, we, we, we could have not caught it at all. So the question is, how do you defend against something like that? You know, and, and, and it, it goes back to the whole public source control piece. Um, there's a lot of trust going on that, that people don't realize that they're trusting people you know, it, it, it's just like, wow, this is software. And it wasn't too hard to build because I didn't have to build this big chunk sure. that some really friendly person in Canada built for me 10 years ago and occasionally updates maybe. And I wonder if it's been taken, it's been looked at recently for any vulnerabilities in the tools it uses. Hmm, I'm not really sure. You know what I mean? Yeah, it, sure, it, absolutely. It's, it's, a, it's a hard problem to solve. And obviously XZUtils, that was clearly a nation state attack. That was in planning for three years. Oh. A malware attack that took three years to put together that one very industrious developer discovered is part wow. of a test run. So we, we had to take a second and step back and think about one, how blindingly lucky we were that we caught that. But also how, how do we defend against the next one? Because Sure is, I'll get out. Someone else is doing that exact same thing somewhere on some important project. Sure. And we don't know who, we don't know where, and we don't know where it's going to end up, and we don't know how we're going to find it. And there is the, the open source community is is largely tight and and mostly very friendly and um serious about things like this. I mean, you couldn't you can't go to anybody in the open source community really who's who's a name who runs a big project and say so what do you think about security well i'm going oh man okay so here's what we're doing i, I mean everyone's very they're serious about it, it. Like, taking it seriously. how do you defend against things that? still get through you know ah so yeah that's my thing <laughs> on open source, <laughs> and source absolutely
<laughs> yeah, I, I would. Um, so open source is, is awesome, but it does it's come with some awesome. risks as well. And I would yeah. point out that even closed source comes with some risk. I mean, there's a lot of trust. If you're running Windows <laughs> or uh, yeah. Mac iOS uh, or iOS on your operating system, you're yeah. trusting that that's right. You've got the that there's yeah. no malware in there, that they didn't that's sneak right. something in. And, uh, but and, but the difference is oversight. The oversight, yeah. There's there's a so million. Far. There's there are. I mean, not a million, there are millions and millions of people using Windows every day and yeah. testing it and banging on it. Yeah. Whereas that and some, also small, there's some open source project may have a few dozen people. Yeah, and and also Microsoft has a bunch of people like you. You know, pe people that are they, inside watching the process <laughs> happen and are very we likely are. to Well, go, there's where the trust comes in. You, you, you yeah. believe that if I find something, then I'm going to raise a flag and, right. and, and uh, do what I can. And historically, things. largely, that has been true, not specifically yeah. for you necessarily, but globally within yeah. the large companies, people go, hey, whoa, 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 <laughs> this is a problem. And, and that's good. <laughs> that's how Mark Rosinovich got his job, by the way, is because he was pointing out vulnerabilities in Windows. Yeah. That's right. Finally, somebody at Microsoft said, tell you what, why don't you just join why us? Why don't you just come and work for it? That's right. Fix this stuff. And then I think it worked out for both him and for Microsoft. I, I think it did. I think it worked out okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hey, we're just about at time. Is there are anything that we haven't covered that. that, that you know, I could talk about. about this stuff forever <laughs> and ever and ever. But um, I mean, take the time to use the tools that are out there to make your code better. Um, I, I can't, can't step aside without recommending the OWASP, uh, proactive controls. It basically, if you've heard of the OWASP top 10, that's the open yeah. worldwide application security project, big global group. That's about evangelizing security. Absolutely. And I've, I've had Troy hunt on this show a few times. Oh yes. Uh, he's Perfect. a heavy yeah. contributor Troy. to that. Troy, Troy is, Troy is, is way up there. Yeah. Um, and, um, the, the, the OWASP top 10 is probably the most famous, but in reality, from as far as usefulness is concerned, mostly you roll it up and smack your CIO with it until they give you money for security. <laughs> um, there's not a lot of guidance in there. The, the proactive controls are the guidance side of the top 10. Basically, it's everything in the top 10 written down in such a way of what you should do about it. So read that. Take, take that, look at it, and then pick something and go, you know what? We could be doing that better and start doing that better because it's, I mean, it's overwhelming if you look at everything, but if you take it one piece at a time, think, hmm, I wonder if we're not parameterizing our queries when we do X, Y, and Z with our hmm. RF. Then th that's one thing, one less thing on your threat uh, profile. So, oh, that's the OAuth guidance, what is it? O OWASP, yeah, OWASP proactive controls. Proactive controls, I'll look at it. Yeah, I'll, get, I'll get it to you. Yeah, we can I'll put this in the show this, notes. notes. Yeah. And uh, I'll have to, it looks like this is from the OWASP.org. Is that correct? Yeah, OWASP.org, right. Uh, I see. Okay. I will add that to the show notes. Yeah. Uh, are you still speaking, doing a lot of public speaking? Uh, I've just recently kind of re-entered that arena after uh, the lockdown, which, yeah, which me too. locked me down more than most. Uh, it, it, was, it was more of a, a push, a little bit more of a push for me. So I'm just kind of getting back into it. I uh, spoke at CodeMash um, on a new project I'm, on, I'm working on, an open source project, funny enough, Me too. Called, called Valid. Oh, um, cool. And um, that, was, uh, that, that, was a good, that was a good time. Um, and I've given that talk a couple of times since then. Um, and I've done, uh, been doing some of the security B-sides and like that. If you're an application developer or just a technologist in general watching and you want to see what the security industry is like, go hit a B-sides up wherever there's, there's 190 of them all over the world. Go hit up one of those. It's a good general friendly um, take on information security and the community involved. It, it's, it's not as tough as like people are like, oh, I'm going to pack up and go to DEF CON. Well, yeah, okay. But it's like drinking from a fire hose. So <laughs> go to a local B-sides, be three, 400 people, uh, some good content and a lot of camaraderie. And it yep. isn't overwhelming or scary. I've been, <laughs> right. I've been to those and I totally yeah. agree. Yeah. Uh, all right. Hey, Bill, thank you so much for your time. This has uh, been really educational. I Absolutely hope, people, I hope it scared people enough <laughs> to go out and do something. <laughs> yes, indeed. My, my first ever talk was a uh, security talk was talking to the .NET developers group in Columbus. And I, after my talk, I said it was a lightning talk, actually. After my talk, I said, okay, how many people learned something today? And every hand went up. 
And I was like, how many people had never didn't know any of this and are going to cry themselves to sleep tonight? And only about <laughs> half the hands went down. <laughs> and there was like 100 people in the group, too. It was like, I was like oh, OK. Awesome. <laughs> so that's that's what that's why I'm glad I'm out in the community talking, because I come from a dev background. So I know what everybody's dealing with. And to help you as best I can, you know. The best part of technology, in my opinion, anyway, is connecting with friends like you, David.